In this short video, I want to address a question that I'm often asked, namely, am I allowed to change my interview questions in the course of my study? So basically, I have conducted several interviews, then I realize maybe I want to ask some more questions, or maybe I want to adjust some questions, or maybe I forgot to include these questions in the original interview. So am I allowed to add these questions to my subsequent interviews? And if, if so, if I am, how does that affect my study? So how does it affect credibility? How does it affect uh, comparability specifically? Because what, uh, how can I compare or how can I make claims specifically based on some participants uh, expre expressing certain attitude or belief if other participants never had a chance to express these attitudes because I never asked them these questions. So how do we go about this problem? In practice so the short answer to this question is yes it's absolutely uh, you're absolutely allowed to do this it's actually a very common practice especially in some uh, research designs and some methodologies such as grounded theory for example where you have the constant comparison method so constant comparison method where you are gathering the data you're constantly making comparisons you're constantly analyzing and rather than doing this analysis after you're done with your study you're doing that uh, as you're collecting your data, specifically because as you're analyzing the data, you may decide that based on this analysis, you want to adjust the interview transcripts, you want to maybe ask some more questions. So, so again, how does that affect our study? Does it not affect the credibility and comparability in our data? And to understand the answer to this question or how to go about this practical problem, we have to quickly uh, remember the role of uh, of numbers and qualitative research and qualitative research and qualitative data analysis and also in reporting the results so uh so as i often say in my in my videos i often remind you that uh, in qualitative research the numbers do not necessarily imply how important something is so that's pretty important so the, the study itself is not set up for such comparisons for making claims therefore in theory if 17 participants uh let's say uh, discuss certain topic because I asked them this question, but three participants never did. It doesn't mean that it's a big problem because now I can't compare, I can't make claims. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem that it's important because it wasn't 20 out of 20, but rather 17 out of 20 participants. It doesn't necessarily mean that because again, the numbers, um, numbers in qualitative research do not imply how important something is. So now to give you a quick example, if I ask 20 school children about their experiences with their teachers, and let's say 19 out of 20 tell me that they wish they had more fun, more play and more games during uh, their classes. And then there is one participant who said that there is actually a problem because the teacher was acting, let's say, violently or or uh, racist or something like that. So now uh, think, think about it. Does it mean so based on this example, the fact that only one person mention this doesn't it mean it's not important of course it doesn't it's actually super important even though it's just one person so this shows you that numbers definitely do not mean do not indicate how important something is now having said this do i want to report on these numbers i actually do and you may know you've probably heard me say that in other videos i'm a big uh, fan of using numbers in qualitative research so so at the same time having said what i said in this example I still want to indicate that I still need to ex at least say that it was one person, not all 20. Does it mean, again, does it mean it's, it's uh, less of a problem? Of course not. It's still just as serious a problem as it was. However, the reader has the right to know that it wasn't everybody that mentioned this problem. It wasn't that all 20 children said that this teacher is violent. It's actually, it does make a difference to know that it's, it's a single experience, even though, like I said, it doesn't mean it's not important. So now with this in mind and remembering that the numbers do not really indicate how important something is, it's simply not going to be a problem if not all of my participants uh, express a certain opinion or comment on something. Uh, it's not going to be a problem in the first place because of this role of numbers. And secondly, what I'll do, as always, I'll be very transparent about it. So that's kind of a so solution. The first solution to this problem uh, before me going through some additional uh, ways and additional solutions to this problem. So the first solution is simply to be transparent and explain, e even if it's 15 or it's 11 to 9 or whatever the proportion, I can say that this seemed to be a predominant view uh, expressed by 11 participants who were asked about this and then just explain that the remaining nine uh, were never asked about this because they were the first nine, for example, interviewees and the questions were adjusted after this. So that's uh, that's what I can do and that's kind of a solution to this problem. So that's the first solution, having that 
uh, bearing in mind that, um, uh, that role of numbers, being transparent and simply explaining uh, to the reader what happened and at the same time just not worrying about this affecting this uh, final result because it's definitely not and it's definitely not indicating that something is maybe a little bit less important but then if you decide that actually in your study it does make a huge difference it can't be like this it can be like this and i have to do something about it there are actually two solutions uh, to this situation now before i continue just a quick reminder that if you're struggling with any element of your study any aspect whether it relates to research planning or implementation or data analysis or planning your methods your research questions your research proposal or anything else feel free to explore my website explore all the different services that i offer and don't hesitate to reach out ask me questions if you're not sure and then we'll see if we may be if we may arrange a one-to-one -one Zoom tutorial during which we can address these questions together. So the first solution uh, is simply to treat these two groups separately. And people do that a lot as well. So uh, two or more groups. So basically because they were asked slightly different questions, and this will depend how different the questions uh, were, uh, but you can treat them as different groups. You can treat them in different groups. You can analyze them separately. You can even compare the different thematic frameworks later or merge them together. It, it's really up to you what you do. Again, as long as you're transparent about the process. But you can absolutely do that. You can explain why these are different groups and explain that this is due to this different interview guide. So that's the solution number one. And the solution number two is more kind of universal because it's something I often talk about, especially when I talk about validity and qualitative research, namely reach out to the participants. So that's called member check-in. Again, you can watch it, this video that you can see on your screen now. I explain member check-in in more detail, but basically reaching out to your participant and asking for clarification. That's something you'd normally do anyway if you want to make sure that uh, your study is valid and maybe there are things where you're not sure about certain meaning prior to jumping into conclusions and interpreting things for your participant, you may reach out and ask for clarification. And in our described situation in this, in this video, uh, you can do the same uh, except ask them to comment on these additional things that you never had a chance to ask them. So you can ask them, you can explain that there were some other questions that, uh, that arise from previous, from other uh, for the analysis of other transcripts and you'd really appreciate if they could also uh, give you some additional insight because you never had a chance to ask these questions. That's absolutely fine and you can definitely do this. But to do this, you need to make sure that you have asked their, their permission ideally when you first met them. So you have to do it anyway. Ideally, regardless of what's going to happen later during the interview, you should tell them that maybe there is there may be a situation when you want to reach out for something, either ask additional questions or just ask for clarification, which is the first uh, scenario of member check-in that I described. So it's a good idea to always tell them that they, they can ex <laughs> they can expect this to happen and ask them if that's okay. So that's something that I would do regardless. And if you've done that, then again, there is absolutely no problem. You can do this. If you change your interview questions, you can reach out and explain that this is what happened. So that's uh, probably the most practical way to go about this, uh, this situation that I described in this video.